So today is the first Sunday of Advent. There are four candles, as Melanie said, uh, that represent the season of Advent. And today we light the candle that represents hope. Hope in Jesus Christ. You know, Advent was begun as a tradition around the third century by the early church. And it's a time of preparation for worship of Almighty God at Christmas. This year, we had a really colorful discussion um, in our session about, um, you know, there were some folks, um, I included, um, questioned on whether we really needed to worship on Christmas Day. Um, whether we really needed to do that. Shouldn't we just give everybody, you know, time to be at at home? I got to tell you, um, your session is a bunch of godly women and men. Um, They were like, so you think, pastor, that we should, uh, that we should basically stay at home when we celebrate Christ's birth, when we could be here and worship? And, uh, and I said, no, (laughs) <laughs> but this is a time to prepare our hearts um, for Advent. So today we're going to embark on a four-week journey that we're going to call the Advent Conspiracy. We're calling it the Advent Conspiracy. So Advent is a traditional time of prep for Christmas. A conspiracy is a plot to overturn the existing social order. I love a great conspiracy theory. What could be better than an Advent conspiracy, right? So I'm inviting you to join us as we plot to change how we prepare and view and celebrate Christmas this year. Take a look at the video. So this Christmas, we're going to be talking a lot about, and especially this morning, about what it means to spend less and give more. The Advent Conspiracy is being done by hundreds of churches this year, and it's been done by thousands of churches here in America um, over the last 10 years or so. 
And we're going to join up this year and figure out how we can make some changes also. So Thanksgiving morning. We were at my folks' house for lunch on Thanksgiving, and they still get this thing called, what do you call that thing that gets, shows up in your driveway? It's in a plastic sack. A newspaper, thank you. I mean, uh, who knows? I mean, who still gets a newspaper? They got a newspaper we unrolled that I'm not going to tell you that I was looking for the sports section to go hide somewhere and read. Um, but I almost couldn't find it because of all the ads in the newspaper. Yeah, I mean, there was just all kinds of stuff in there. Now, I was looking for the sports page. There were people that were fighting to get to the ads. That's right. And uh, so we were there, and I got to thinking a little bit about Christmas time and all the stuff that we try to get at Christmas time. It's kind of like, you know, everything kind of ramps up. Like It's kind of like the rat race, or I like to refer to it as the hedgehog race because we had a hedgehog named Henry. Um, so we would sit there and we would watch Henry the Hedgehog on his little wheel. And he'd be like, and um, like the kids would be like, go, Henry, go, Henry. We didn't know Henry was going to die. But anyway, so Henry's like, it's on the wheel. He's running, go, Henry, and he stops. And we kind of wondered, you know, aloud, you know, what, I wonder what Henry's thinking right now. I wonder what he's running towards. And he's running, 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 running. And then we're like, go, 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 Henry, go, 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 go. And it kind of feels like that at Christmas time for some of us. It totally does. And here's the deal. We end up frantically running from shop to shop to figure out if we can get enough for the people that we love, right? Our children, our spouses, our friends, our parents, our workmates. And we always wonder if we've got enough stuff so that they know that we love them. But the question is, how much is enough? How much is enough? I'll tell you how it works at, at our house. Um, We've got so much stuff that we actually got a wall in the garage that has toys and stuffed animals and stuff that we've collected over the years there just so there's room enough for more stuff, you know, inside, inside. We've got to wonder, what is all this saying about us? Now, I'm not the Grinch. I'm not implying to any of you people that you not give anyone any gifts. What I am saying, however, is that maybe we need to ratchet it back a little bit. And if we ratcheted it back together, maybe it wouldn't feel so weird. And maybe we could hang on and maybe we could do it together. I have a buddy who asked some of his friends on Facebook um, what they do to make Christmas more meaningful and keep their gift giving, you know, within the realm of this universe. Um, and here's some of the things that some of the folks um, fed back to him. They're homemade gifts, some of them. The first one is a Yule log. Now, I don't recommend that you make Yule logs in Florida unless you just want to keep it for a keepsake or something because it's Florida people, but, but they, they recommended making Yule logs and putting a little prayer for the person on the Yule log and giving it to them. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Another recommendation on the Facebook page um, was actually, um, if they're a really good friend, uh, getting pictures and putting together and maybe putting them to a song on a DVD and giving it to the person with a note. That would be very meaningful. Um, there are lots of Ideas for gift certificates. One dad said, I give my kids one break the rules certificate every year. A break the rules certificate. And they said, if they come and they give their certificate to me and they say, dad, I want to skip school and go fishing today, I actually have to say yes and do it. There are way too many teachers in here this morning. So, so but other gifts, there are other gift certificate ideas, but people, uh, things, giving people gift certificates to do things together with the people they love and as a family, or maybe even you doing something with those people to draw them closer together, concentrating on the relationships more than the, than the gift. And it's so important. Melly and I, We've done several iterations of this over the years. Has anybody ever made homemade candles for people at Christmas time? I have the scars. 
to prove it. I mean, we actually cooked the wax and we made the candles um, and, and wrote Bible verses, inscribed Bible verses on each of the little candles. And uh, we're never doing that again. Uh, but anyway, one of the things that I have heard is people doing gift baskets with like games or movies and, and, and hot cocoa and, and, um, and popcorn in there just to give people, you know, something to sit around and do together, together. Making the presence the most important part of the giving of the present. Well, you get the idea. None of those gifts um, cost more than 10 or 15 bucks, but they all have special meaning. They're the kinds of gifts that you keep forever. I don't know about you, but the last, last week we just cleaned out a whole bunch of stuff and threw it out. And a lot of it, when we had to come down to it, a lot of the store-bought stuff got tossed in favor of, I got <laughs> for those of you who did Santa's workshops next weekend, last year they made, kids made, keychains made of uh, washers and nuts. It's like holding um, a, a roll of quarters in your hands. Don't ask me about that. Anyway, it's like holding a roll of quarters in your hand. I love that keychain. It's, it's awesome, but that's, you know, we just can't get rid of that kind of stuff. It means so much. So I'm encouraging to look at us, the, for us to look at this year, how we approach Christmas. Um, there are always ways that we can spend less and give more. But the greatest gift that we can give at Christmas is the gift of hope, right? It really is. And do you know people who are living without much of that today? Without much of hope. And we're turning our attention to the prophets over the next few weeks in the Old Testament who looked toward a coming hope, the coming of the king who would restore them, the nation that they loved and they called home, Israel. So our scripture passage this morning is from Jeremiah. Jeremiah is one of the happiest people in all of... Okay, he's not. So, so Jeremiah was a prophet in a really hard time in the nation of Israel's history. Um, he was there. He, he actually prophesied and preached for 30 years, 30 years before the Babylonians came and sacked the southern kingdom of Israel. And in the passage that we're going to see this morning, this is Jeremiah's word of hope to the people of Israel after their homeland had been destroyed by invaders. Friends, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. You say about this place, that's Jerusalem, it is a desolate waste without people or animals. Yet in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem that are inhabited by neither people or animals now, there will be heard once more the sounds of joy and gladness, the voices of the bride and the bridegroom, and the voices of those who bring thank offerings to the house of the Lord, saying, Give thanks to the Lord Almighty, for the Lord is good. His love endures forever. For I will restore the fortunes of the land as they were before, says the Lord. And from a little bit later in that same chapter, in those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. <laughs> Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Heaven and earth will pass away. God's word will never. So uh, if you take out your Bibles, um, the Old Testament basically, you can divide it up into three basic Parts. The first part is the Torah. It's the law. It's the writings of Moses, if you will. The second part um, are the historical and poetry writings there. It ends up with Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. And the last big section are the prophets. Um, the prophets uh, prophesying the office of prophet, that job was not a great job. It was not a great gig. It usually had a very short shelf life. Why is that? Because prophets were called by God to speak the truth to people around them and to people in power. Uh, the Hebrew word for prophet is navi, navi, and it literally means spokesperson or mouthpiece. And in the, in the, the, 
the way the prophets were, they were the mouthpiece or the spokesman for God, for God. So I read the, the Old Testament prophets a couple of times in the last three weeks, um, and I noticed four things, four things that pretty much all of those prophets had in common. And as you read your daily study guides this week, and you've got Old Testament passages along with your devotionals and your daily study guide, I think they'll help you understand what you're reading a little bit better. Okay, so the first thing here that I noticed about the prophets, there these noticeable characteristics. The first is this. They were primarily concerned with changing the present, not the future. Now, when you think of prophet, what do you think about? You think of the future, right? Right? Uh, that's definitely because the prophet prophesy, we think, okay, you're foretelling something. You're foretelling the future. But in my reading of the prophets, they were very much more concerned and said very much more about what was going on in their cities and towns and neighborhoods and country that day. And when they prophesied, it was usually about consequences. If we don't do this today, if we don't take care of the poor and the helpless and the hopeless and those without a voice today, if we turn our backs on God today, we will reap the consequences later. Or on the good side, we need to take care of people today. We need to take care of the issues today. We need to take care of the, the homeless and the hopeless and the hungry. And if we do, we will be rewarded in the future. The prophets, the first thing, the prophets were much more concerned about changing the present, not the future. The second thing that I noticed that was kind of a revelation to me is this. Prophets almost always rooted for the underdog. Prophets were almost always rooted for the underdog. Um, so Thanksgiving, how many of you sit around the TV and watch football on Thanksgiving? I mean, there were three pretty good games, professional games this year. So, you know, traditionally there were two teams, right? Before the NFL figured out they could make a lot more money if they added, never mind. So there are two teams that played. One was... Detroit, oh, New England, oh, that's a, the evil empire. So Detroit and Dallas, Detroit and Dallas, right? So Dallas, nobody in my house ever rooted for Dallas. We just didn't. Um, the second, Detroit, I mean, didn't you feel kind of sorry for Detroit? They went like a decade without winning a game on Thanksgiving. Um, and, and the people in our house usually tended to pull for the underdog. We pulled for Detroit, well, in the same way, sort of, um, the prophets, the prophets could always be found by the depressed, the wounded, the hurt, and those without a voice. If you want to find, and if you found those people, the prophets would be right there next to them. Do you know why? Because God is the champion. God is the champion of the oppressed and the poor and the hopeless, and those without a voice. There was really kind of, was, and like I said, it was really kind of irritating to just the normal everyday folks. And it was infuriating to kings and people in power because the prophets were talking specifically to them. That's why Jeremiah spent most of his adult life in prison. And that was okay because most of the prophets were either executed or exiled. Nobody wanted these prophets around being the Navi, being the mouthpiece, being the spokespeople for God for very long because it was a very inconvenient message as a general rule. So we got the first lens that we have of the prophets. They were primarily interested in changing the present, not predicting the future. The second is prophets almost always rooted for the underdog. And the third and the fourth are very closely related, and they're these. They talked about, the prophets talked about two primary sins. I mean, you can categorize what those prophets preached for and against into two categories, and they're these. The first was idolatry, and the second was injustice. Idolatry and injustice. Now, we all know what idolatry is, right? I mean, we had two sermons ago. We had a whole sermon series on, on you know, things that, never mind. So, idolatry is putting it, Anything or anyone before God, before God. Friends, 
we take a long look in the mirror, who's guilty of idolatry? All of us. All of us. Here's the lie that we're told. And it's kind of counterintuitive when you speak it. The lie is that I love people too much not to love them more than God. They're here right now. They're in front of me. I need to love them more than God. And here's what God says. And we've all found it true. When you put God at the top of your priority list, what improves? Your relationships. Normally, when you get your priorities in order, when you're following God first, you're able to live a more sacrificial life. You're able to live a more frugal life. You're able to live a more helpful life. You're able to actually get your eyes off yourself and onto the people that you love to help and serve them. So the counterintuitive part is every area of your life will improve if you put God first in your life. And we're all guilty of not doing it of not doing it. Idolatry. The second thing there is injustice. There are two words that appear most often in the, in the Hebrew Bible. Um, the two words that appear most often in the Old Testament, justice and righteousness when it comes to talking about injustice. It's mishpat and zedekah. And those two words are used interchangeably to describe attributes of God and attributes that we're supposed to have. Um, that it, they can mean uh, in just doing the right thing for the right reason or having right motives. Melanie is always, she's really big on you do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. Um, you shouldn't have to be bribed to do the, this is Melanie, you know. I shouldn't have to bribe you not to stop at McDonald's on the way home. It's the right, no, I'm not, but, but honestly... But honestly, you do the right thing because it's the, it's the right thing to do. That's this idea. It's being in a right relationship with God and with other people. It's showing compassion and mercy to people who don't deserve it from you. It's making sure everybody's being treated fairly. That people who have been pushed around are protected. It's all of those things and more. And Jesus summarizes in the great commandment like we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Love the Lord your God with all your heart mind and soul. And the second commandment is just like it. It's just as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. So utterly important how we look out for the people that God's put in our lives and in our purview to protect them. How does the prophet Isaiah say it? The prophet Isaiah says this, you keep wondering why everything's going to hell in a handbasket around you. Okay, that's my version. You fast, you pray to me, and it doesn't make a bit of difference. It doesn't mean anything to me. But this is the fast, the prayer that I choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the bonds of the slave, to let the oppressed go free. It's to share your bread with the hungry and bring your homeless poor into your home. When you see the naked, clothe them. Don't hide yourself from your own kin or your own family. How many of you have ever had family members who kept coming to you for help and coming to you for help and coming to you for help and coming to you for help? And what did you end up doing? I'm not going to answer the phone anymore. I'm not going to answer the door. Evidently, this isn't a new problem. Um, evidently, it's been around for a little while, for a little while. But, but what God is looking for is what the prophets are saying that we're not doing. Isn't that... Interesting. Friends, here's what we do. We, we find out when we look at the world. The world is broke. Can we see that? Can we see that? You, when you walk outside, you look around, um, you look at the news or whatever, the world is broke. And you know who God sent to fix it? King Jesus. And you know who King Jesus' subjects are? Us. <laughs> Us. Us, we're supposed to be about God's work here on earth, his healing work here on us. You know, there are two gospels that are preached here with righteousness, right living, right relationships, and justice 
doing right by people and making sure that right is being done in your presence and around you. There are two gospels there. The first is, it's really important to know God. It's really important to know Jesus. Changes your life, changes your outlook, alters your trajectory in life. And the second is this, you've got to put your money where your mouth is. You've got to let your feet and your hands do the talking about how much you love and are prioritizing God. In Ephesians, can you pop the Ephesians verse up here, please? It says this, and it kind of describes that dichotomy a little bit. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We're supposed to be doing, we're supposed to be acting on God's behalf to heal and to fix this world. In James, James says it this way, true religion and undefiled is to care for the widows and the orphans. Author Brian McLaren says, the gospel isn't primarily about how to get to heaven, it's how to get heaven here. How to get heaven here to earth. In the name of Christ, we offer hope to the hopeless. How many of you were kind of moved by the video at the beginning with the the clean water and the whole idea back in 2006 when this was started, the estimate was $10 billion could fix the world's water issues. Did you notice the new number 10 years later? It's $20 billion. That seems like a lot of money, doesn't it? Doesn't it? I don't know how many of you noticed um, that Castro died this week. Yeah? You notice that? Here's the deal. Cuba has opened right up. And you know what we've been offered the opportunity to do? Is to help supply clean water in communities through churches. Through churches. For 750 bucks, $750, we can put a clean water filtration system in a church, in a community, so that that place can be a place where people can come receive not only water that is healthy for them, but is the living water also. That's an opportunity that we have on our plate. So $750, you people are smarter than I am. If we committed to doing 10 of those this Christmas and go and install them next year, 750 times 10 is... Thank you. Thank you. See, that's, that's good. I've done this three services now and I still can't remember. Um, it's, it's about $7,500. So what would it look like? What would it look like? If we raised $7,500 this Christmas and bought 10 water filtration units to put in 10 churches in 10 communities in our neighbor, Cuba, down there, and then went early next year and installed them, what would that look like? We are called to bring hope to the hopeless. That's the mission that we're supposed to be about. One of the passages that many of us have memorized um, is is Jeremiah 29, 11. Does this sound familiar? And it's this, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Are you seeking the Lord with all, with all your heart? Are you? I'm telling you, if it feels like, just like Israel in the northern kingdom and Judah in the southern kingdom, they were both eventually raised by the Assyrian army in the north and the Babylonian army in the south, destroyed, destroyed. 
Jeremiah prophesied for 30 years before the Babylonians came and destroyed the southern kingdom of Israel. And he said, repent, repent, turn back to the Lord, stand by the poor and the homeless and the hopeless and the fatherless and the widow and the orphan. And he was ignored and put in prison. And he stopped preaching that. It's very stark at the end of Jeremiah. And he said this, Jeremiah said this. He said, just surrender don't even fight. God has turned his back on you because you've turned your back on him. Just surrender. Just surrender. I want you to listen to the hopeful tone of our passage that we read in the beginning from Jeremiah with that in mind. Here it is. This is what the Lord says you say about this place, it is a desolate waste without people or animals. Yet in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are deserted, inhabited by neither people or animals, there will be heard once more, one day, the sound of joy and gladness, the voices of bride and bridegroom, and the voices of those who sing and bring thank offerings to the house of the Lord, saying, give thanks to the Lord Almighty, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. Friends, Jeremiah spoke this word over a land that had been destroyed. And he said, there is a hope. And that was his message to Judah in 500 BC. And it's our message today. It's our message today in Palm Beach County in 2016. It's about the things that you do to bring hope to those in your life who need it. Last week, you all brought hope in those Thanksgiving dinners that you had been donating money and food for. We were able to hand out almost 30 Thanksgiving dinners this week. People were coming in on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday to Ruth's Pantry. And you know what? We were able to give them a turkey and all the fixins and a pie. And you have never seen people who were so grateful for anything. It was amazing. And you, you, you did that. You did that. You know, the angel tree thing, the angels were gone so fast off the tree last week. I mean, some, I went to grab for one and somebody threw me down and trampled me to get to the tree to get one of the angels. Okay, maybe not. Anyway, so, but here's the, you know what? Over in our fellowship hall in two weeks, there are going to be children of currently incarcerated moms and dads, and we're going to smother them with presence. Can we give them enough? It certainly doesn't feel like we can give them enough. And we're going to pray over them and we're going to sing with them and we're going to feed them. That is how you all are making a difference. You're making a difference. So here's my invitation to you this Christmas. The first part of the invitation is this. Um, Exactly. Let's try to live more simply. Let's try to live more simply. You can spend less and give more. Do you know what the temptation is with some of the stuff that I read earlier? It takes too much time. It takes too much. I don't have enough time to make gifts for the people that I love. Make the time. Exactly. Make the time. Make the time. Make the time to do that. Live, live simpler this year. And second is just to bear, the, bear hope to people in your life, in your family, to your neighbors, in your workplace. Be a person who brings great hope and encouragement to the people in your spheres of influence. You got it? Can we do it? Yes. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Dear God, we want to be ambassadors of your hope. We confess that we fall for whatever's in front of our face. We're idolaters, we're idolatrous. Help us and heal us. We confess that we only see those in the bubble where we live. In Loxahatchee and Wellington and the acreage and Royal Palm, we fail to see the folks who are truly hungry those who are hungry physically and those who are hungry for love and acceptance and purpose, those who live in darkness and need to see a great light. 
Father God, as we enjoy Christmas with our families, may we offer light and hope to those living in darkness and despair. And to that end, we offer ourselves to you today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.